Hello everyone, MasterZeon1201 here, and in this video we'll be talking about the BoxCutter718 underscore 10 release log. For this update, not a whole lot was going on, however the re-edition of ReCut is enough to warrant me doing a video discussing it because it was sorely missed and is definitely needed as a troubleshooting tool for users who are dealing with issues whenever it comes to inset, which is the most accident prone of our operations. Another thing is Whenever it comes to dealing with subdivision and dots, we attempted some improvements there, which also resulted in an interesting new way to deal with dynamic dots. But for the most part, this update is centralized still around getting all the information that needs to be available to the user to be upfront in the helper. So that way, basically at the press of D, once it's activated, you are able to access almost everything that BoxCutter has to offer without even having to go into the plethora of additional options that just shows the amount of depth that BoxCutter has. So as we continue to work along this release, we'll continue updating the helper and continuing to streamline the experience to try to give users just an all-in-one go-to for them to get to exactly where they need to go. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Inset is one of the more interesting operations inside of BoxCutter because it derives the shape in order to create the operation. So to demonstrate it in action, we'll select this cube and press Q and go under Mesh Tools and we're just going to sphere cast it to turn it into a sphere. I'll press D and inside the helper, we'll just change over to Ngon and I'm going to just click, 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 and click. And we're just gonna click on this last point and extrude this out. And from here, I'll press I in order to change this into an inset. And the interesting thing about inset is unlike the rest of the cutters or the rest of the operations, this one actually excels a bit whenever it comes to curved surfaces because it derives a geometry. However, um, to further explain it, at least completely in depth, let's press Q and control click bevel to just add a bevel. And we see that after adding a bevel, it definitely gets a little bit crazy with the surface. And that's because of the whole derived mesh aspect of inset. So if we press Alt V, we can jump into wireframe and we see that there's some near misses where geometry is just getting a little clustered up close to the area where the bevel's trying to go. So at this time, I do recommend, you know, adding a weld modifier and then we can shift scroll it above bevel. And as we roll it, we see that it begins to clean up a little bit. However, this is only a kind of temporary measure since we do see it kind of eating away at the edge boundary a little bit, causing it to get a little bit compromised. But it definitely looks a little bit better now than it does without a weld. If we were to turn it off, we can see what it looks like. So that's kind of one aspect of inset. However, if we were to bring in another cube and turn it into a sphere again and go into inset again, we could talk about another aspect of it that's interesting and unique to it. And that is that if we were to inset this, we could press D and there's an option for basically inset slice. And so what I like to do is inset first so I see what's going on and then I'll inset slice which will basically give me back a very nice slice that's contoured to the surface that I can use for things like transformation for revealing what's underneath. So it's a common thing that I like to do and work sometimes. But the other thing about inset that makes it unique is that because it derives the geometry, it can also derive failure. And so if I were to basically draw a box and we place it right here, very close to this edge. If we were to basically draw a box around this and press I and jump into inset, we don't even see anything. If we press T, it's just gonna begin flashing. And so this is a common thing I'm sure a lot of users run into. Whenever they first begin using box cutter, they begin um, using inset on a surface that's been compromised with areas that just aren't good for solidification and this sort of thing occurs. So, you know, I'm personally not a very big fan of this issue. And so it's our goal to definitely come up with a way to mitigate this issue from happening. And the best way to do that is actually to derive the inset from the original mesh that doesn't have that original box that we cut into at present. So if we press D, after pressing pause, if we press D, there's an option for recut, which allows us to basically derive it from the original mesh. And if we press T, we see that we're able to cut all the way through this thing. And that's really just the uh, power of recut. When it was missing, I was like, wow, we really gotta get that thing back quickly because when it comes to inset, there's no way to really protect yourself if you have a bunch of cuts and you're trying to derive an inset. So to show it again, I could just cut a box here or even a box here. 
And because of what's going on with the edge and the way Solidify is going to react, the Solidify isn't going to be able to get very big and perform the inset. So if I press I and we press T, we see that we've run into a problem. Well, this is where we can pause it, press D, and activate recut, which as we see updates the mesh in real time, allowing us to get back what we're losing. And so you gotta keep in mind that this is using a inset based on the unmodified mesh. So it's not gonna have the circle cut that we have in here or the box cut we have taken into account, but it definitely will help you get control back over your inset whenever you're working on it. So sometimes whenever it comes to dealing with just a flat edge, I like having snap dots on and then holding control over the surface and bringing out a box. And we can press W to activate wedge and hold control to basically cut a perfect wedge. So if we press S, we can scale up the wedge a little bit. And if we click and apply, we basically have wedged the surface. So let's say we wanted to detail it even more on this wedge. So one way we could approach it is I could press Q and use Everscroll to bring this back. And then we could just begin box cutting on the cutter itself and cut out an area to not be subtracted by the wedge, resulting in this sort of interesting transition, which is something I like to do with radios. However, instead of revealing the cutter, there is alternatively a way in box cutter to do it via slice, where you could click and drag to create a shape like you're seeing me do, press B to bevel, and then tab to drop the shape. If we press D to open the helper, we have an option to jump over to slice and then from here we can activate recut recut is actually originally from slice and so this update aims to add it back to inset because it was initially replaced with inset slice but i truly did miss the feature and i don't like missing features at all so now we can just click and apply and be done however whenever it comes to slice and recut because of the way that it brings the mesh back, it causes a little bit of Z fighting. So I'm a big fan of pressing H and just being a wire display whenever I'm working if I don't want the shading of the operation to be in the way because I'm well aware of what operation I'm performing. In fact, I'll press tab to bring my dots back up and we can bring the base of this slice up and even press G to move this around to do whatever we want to do. In fact, I'll press V, add an array, roll down the segments with the will and from here we can just click and apply. So this is basically the origin of where recut comes from. The goal is to basically slice back a piece of the mesh unmodified by the modifiers that you currently have present. So it's really interesting uh, in terms of workflow, but it's definitely one of those things that you gotta get in and play with a little bit to find an area where it can work for you. Anytime I'm referring to shape parity, I'm referring to what options are enabled whenever you jump from shape to shape. So every shape has a default state that I feel should be there whenever you click to activate it. For example, if users clicked on Ingon and Ingon was actually unlocked or was in lasso or cyclic wasn't enabled, then I feel it would be a very confusing experience. So to provide a very vanilla experience to everyone, ensuring that everyone gets to the same destination that we put them in, we have something called shape parity, where basically shapes retain basically default information that we set. So previously, circle had the ability to be set to star, and then if you were to jump from Ingon and then jump back to circle, it would actually retain the option of changing to star, which I felt was a mistake because typically I'll just be working. I'll bring up the D helper to change my shape on the fly. And then I would jump to circle and accidentally be drawing a star. While star is quite nice, it isn't actually popular enough for it to take over as the default. And as far as shape parity goes, the default of circle is actually polygon. So no matter what you do, if you jump over a circle, it'll default to polygon because modifier, believe me, is more than likely on its way out the door unless someone speaks up and says, hey, I do use it to draw a lot of non-destructive screw circles. But really, there's so many easier ways to do it. In fact, you could just turn any circle into a non-destructive circle. In fact, I'll show you. We'll draw this shape and this circle is applied because I can grab this face and rotate it. You know, this thing is applied. Oh God. All right, ended that phone call. All right, back to work. So basically this shape has been applied, but let's say I want it to be non-destructive or what people call non-destructive. If I press Alt X, I can use the mirror and jump to bisect by Alt scrolling and by shift clicking on, or actually let's select the right shape by shift clicking on Y, I can keep it active. So I can also click the bottom 
and then from here I'm just going to click on the X in order to keep the shape. From here the shape has now been simplified to a plane so if I add modifier and I go to screw I can then press X to jump this back over into being a non-destructive circle. So really what is non-destructive and I could still go in and select this point control click mark and begin beveling this thing on an individual level and if we wanted to actually improve the appearance of this circle we could just press Q and under add modifier we just slap a decimate on it and everything's looking very nice however this edge in the middle obviously has to go so we can press X to delete that edge and we see that now we're getting some abnormality so whenever it comes to non-destructive circles one of the issues that we found that we ran into was that the normals would need to be calculated so let's take this object into local mode and let's press alt v and jump over to face orientation and we also probably need to make the shape solid and we see that the normals are rather variable so in order to resolve this we're going to have to press control tilde go into helper locate the screw modifier go under normals and choose calculate order and then flip in order to get this to flip and actually be correct so that's a little involved whenever it comes to a circle but let's change this back to wire alt v and turn off face orientation and now we're at least back in business but just letting users know that shape purity is now in place for circle ensuring that you'll no longer accidentally jump to star by accident which came up in workflow Whenever it comes to snapping, just clicking on the magnet icon in the top bar will enable dots. However, you can also use the D helper to enable snapping just by clicking the magnet icon. It will let you know that dots is enabled. So by holding control and hovering over the surface, we see dynamic dots showing. A user pointed out that whenever you hold control and you press 3 in order to add subdivision, you would run into an issue with speed and performance. So this is something we sought to rectify in this update by attempting a speed up improvement. So hopefully this should resolve issues with adding subdivision and having the dots actually trigger a slowdown. If we press Control Z, I can actually show a really interesting trick that came up as a result. So if we change over to circle and we were to hold control and hover over this front area and we press Control 3, we've now turned this into a rounded shape. However, the dots are still showing for the simplified shape. So that means if I hold control, continue holding control, and I click and drag, I can now create a circle directly in the center based off those original snap points. So just an interesting byproduct. More than likely, we'll be revisiting this topic in the future. It does remind me of a very classic feature I aim to bring back, but just showing you that it is something that we sought to resolve in this update. So let's go ahead and just begin setting up a series of cuts, it's just having a little fun here. And so if you draw a shape and you were to press I, you could activate inset. And in the event that you run into an issue where your inset isn't actually showing because your mesh has a level of complexity that just has issues with the solidification process, you are now able to press D and underneath your inset options, you have an option to enable recut, which then we're able to adjust and we see this deriving from the base mesh and sometimes this can be the difference between success and failure so just letting users know that while we're not trying to change the helper dramatically we do want to continue expanding with the additional options that become available to us as we continue to expand on the workflows inside of box cutter whenever it comes to discussing flip z join there's no easier way to convey it than duplicating this cube with shift D moving it over on the Y press S X in order to scale it in tab in edit mode control R add a loop, loop cut and we'll just grab these two edges and press control X to dissolve them and then we'll grab this edge and press control B in order to bevel we'll just grab this face press E to extrude and now we've modeled an arrow so I'll press D and change over to custom and from here under the shape panel we're just going to click on the plus in order to mark our custom shape as custom so whenever it comes to working in join, uh, even if we were working in basically cut, we could always press J in order to turn to join. And the interesting thing about join is first of all, join is omnidirectional, which is great. But the other thing is that it, the orientation in which you draw the shape can be adjusted pre-operation. So let's say we were wanting to actually start in join and we drew the shape up and we wanted it to point down. Well, we could always press tab press D and just click the option to flip on the Z, which is always available. However, if you want it permanently enabled, you can just click on flip Z, which will then flip the Z of the mesh that you're drawing in. So that way you can always just be pointing in the absolute direction that you want to. 
My current goal with Box Cutter is to have users not have to even understand all the intricacies of Box Cutter. All they have to know is the helper and all the functionality that it offers, and they should be able to have a well rounded experience to get all the way to their destination. So, when it comes to Box, I'm just going to click and drag and create a box, and then we are going to press D to go into helper, and we'll click on bevel in order to begin bringing our bevel in. We'll have to move our mouse in order to close the helper because we've activated an operation. However, we could press tab in order to drop the shape and then press D to bring up the helper again and we'll activate the Q bevel. So whenever it comes to bevel, there's two types of bevels that are able to be done whenever it comes to the base. The one that we're currently looking at is what we call the quad bevel, where basically the bevel is nicely rounded whenever it comes to these corner areas. For this update, one of our options that was a little bit more obscure has now been made more accessible and that is the option for disabling the quad bevel for users who may want to disable the quad bevel for old school type workflows. You are able to do that where basically when you draw the shape in, instead of getting a nice rounded quad bevel, you will just get one that terminates in the way that it does, which is a little bit more traditional and what you would actually expect with this particular modifier setup. So just letting users know that while it is nothing new, it is now actually present for users to enable and disable and have on at their own whim. However, I recommend always having it on. It's something that we usually never even have to talk about. But just in case you wonder about the quad bevel and how you can toggle it off, that is how you are able to do so now, just using the helper. So this one I almost forgot to mention, so I feel terrible about that, but grid box cut basically also now has an option for back faces. So previously we added the ability that for users of box, they would be able to activate a mode called grid where basically you can cut with a box that's actually a grid. So if we just hold control to use this center snap point, we're basically now drawing a grid. But the thing about the grid is if we look at it, we're basically cutting a mesh into this, but there's no back face, which means that all of these pieces are connected. If we were to just press control A and visual geometry to mesh to make everything real, if I press L, we see that it actually selects everything. And that was just a small oversight on my side. So for this update, we added the option for basically fill back. So if I press control Z to undo ever adding that operation and we ensure that fill back is still checked, we will now draw our shape, which now looks a little bit more solid because it has a back to it. But when we click to apply, we've now applied this operation and every piece is now separated. Of course, when it comes to cutting something like this with so many booleans, sometimes guidance geometry is required. In fact, it looks like I just need to place one piece of guidance geometry here in order to assist it. But let's press Alt V and look at it because I'm always interested in the unexpected. You know, there's a couple of ways in which we could have solved this. For example, let's say we didn't want to actually add a guidance edge. Let's say we wanted to solve it using just a Boolean itself. Well, we could always just change it from fast to exact using the helper, and we see that that actually solves it and we're able to complete this operation. But continuing on and not getting sidetracked, if I were to press Control A and do visual geometry to mesh, that means that whenever I press L, this is its own individual piece. This is its own individual piece. This is its own individual piece. And you might be wondering, why would I even care about all these individual pieces? Well, if we press Alt VE just to uh, go to EVHQ, we can press spacebar and just type in rigid body and just add active. And from here, let's activate the physics panel. And I'm going to press L, select this one, press P to separate the selection. And we're going to set this one to passive, which means that all of these are set to active. If we select all of them in edit mode and we press P and we choose separate by loose parts, they're now separated into loose parts. And the good thing about Blender is everything is still currently selected, which means that we could press Shift S and set our origin to the geometry because that's what's going to be needed for this piece to work out. Everything's going to need its origin to be in the correct location. So if we press Shift Spacebar, we see that everything just kind of explodes outward, which is almost what we want. I might change this one to be mesh instead of convex hole just to see if we can get all the pieces to fall out just like that. The next thing we can do as far as playing with rigid bodies is I like to go under the scene panel and go under gravity or not gravity rigid body world and let's turn on split impulse and lower the speed to something like 0.2 and maybe even sub steps per frame to something like 6 and then when we press space bar we get it happening in very slow motion. So just something random. Sometimes I'll go in box cutter and I'll just dice things up and then just play with the animation of them just to see what happens. You know, still just a guy playing with toys, I guess, but just a fun way to have a good time in Blender.